Okay, good. Okay. France, as I've, the title sort of shifts each week, each week, but it's Homeland of Liberty in Europe, Imperialist Power Abroad. And here's what we talked about. And in last week, we talked about the Popular Front, which is still alive in the consciousness of French intellectuals. I just watched an interview the other day, and this uh, fellow referred a number of times both to the Paris Commune of 1870 and to the Popular Front, alliance of center, moderate left, and supported by the communists. And in, in a way, there was an attempt in the 22 election to reestablish something like that, and we'll see it a little later today. But we had Léon Blom as uh, prime minister. There he is giving the socialist salute where they had 133 laws in 73 days. Uh, here he is. He didn't last long in office, but he's lasted long in the memory of some Frenchmen. Uh, Liberty, then you have the German conquest. 1940, Liberty, uh, and we have a government at the town of Vichy where Liberty, Equality, Fraternity is replaced by Family, Work, Fatherland. And here we have Philippe Pétain, the general who was famous in the First World War uh, as commanding the French at Verdun. We talked about that battle. And he says, today I'm starting on the path of collaboration. And collaboration did not have yet the really negative connotation that it came to have. But here he is greeting Hitler. I wanted to also made a mistake last week. I wanted to mention to you in 1942, the French scuttled their fleet to prevent the Nazis from taking over. And right here's the Mediterranean right here. And I said that the French fleet was at Toulouse. Now, if you can look at this, there would be quite a tidal wave to get the French fleet to Toulouse. And in fact, they were at Toulon, right here, uh, east of Marseille on the way to Nice. So I just was a little lesson in geography. But here's the Fourth Republic, 1945 to 58. And you have a purge of the bureaucracy and what are called collaborationists. Here's an image of women whose head were shaved, accused of having collaborated with Germans. Uh, we have trials of high officials. Marshal Pétain was condemned, but later, uh, par uh, not, not pardoned, but his sentence was commuted. The experts, the businessmen and bureaucrats survived almost intact, but there was a purge of intellectuals. And what we have in the Fourth Republic right here is a continued Vichy approach of centralized control and continuing dreams of empire. As Charles de Gaulle says, I cannot prevent the French from being French, whatever that means. Okay, in 1945, Vichy and the French Republic retain their dreams of empire. Now, we're not going to go over each of these, but this is just to give you an idea. You know, for example, French West Africa, it's here. All these are former French colonies, and they're still French colonies in 1945, uh, including Tunis. Algeria is a little different here because France claims that it's not a colony. Uh, that's not what the Algerian nationalists say, but that's what France says. France says. They also retain their interest in here, Indochina, Viet, uh, which later becomes Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia. And we've all lived through horrible things because of that. We'll see some more of that. Well, that was all a review of last week. In 1945 in Algeria, already you have protests where 6,000 or more Algerians are killed. In the port of Haiphong, the French bombard the city. In Madagascar, 1947, there's a nationalist uprising. 
And then Indochina, the, this war goes on 1954. Some of you may remember the name Dien Bien Phu, where the French are surrounded up and way up in the north of Vietnam. The US tries to help, but this is sort of the death knell of the French in Indochina. Uh, and unfortunately, the Americans take over. You may also remember the Suez Crisis of 1956, where the British and the French use the Israelis as a front man, and all the Israelis were willing to do it, to attack Egypt. And I consider this a dying gasp of colonial rule, that they wanted, the British and the French wanted that canal that the uh, Egyptians had nationalized. Uh, and it happened at that point, the Americans and the Russians threatened the British, French, and Israelis. So they were able to stop that war, and the Egyptians got total control of the canal. I've mentioned books from time to time. This is Bernard Fall, a Frenchman. This is a book available in English if you're interested in a very a detailed account of what will happen to the French in Indochina. We have, we've seen any number of books by Americans or British about Indochina. This is a French book focusing on the French. Well, the Fourth Republic wasn't very successful. It had the same kind of wrangling in the parliament that they had in the Third Republic. And Charles de Gaulle, who, as you probably know, was the leader of the French, free French forces in the Second World War, and he emerged as a great hero after the war uh, and was involved in French politics uh, from 40, 1945 to 47 or so. And then he quit. He said, you guys can't come to any decisions. You can't do anything. And then in 58, he is recalled. And they take his suggestions in a referendum to have a strong president form of government. It's what we call now the Fifth Republic, it still exists. And it's, as you see here, Charles de Gaulle, architect of the Fifth Republic. Parliament is still important, but it's not crucial in the way it had been when it kept overthrowing prime ministers in the 1920s and 30s. And one of the things we forget is how important the prefect, prefect is in a centralized system. France is divided into any number of prefectures with a centrally appointed prefect. It's as though the president of the United States were able to appoint the governor of each state. The prefect is a very powerful person in a centralized system. So this is what sets France apart from countries like the United States and Germany, the later West German Republic. Uh, and there has some uh, similarity to the centralized control of the British government in, in the UK. Well, how did we get there from the Fourth Republic to the Fifth Republic? We have this Algerian crisis in 1958 where France is trying to keep Algeria French. The army is bogged down. I just mentioned Dien Bien Phu. Uh, paratroopers threaten to invade metropolitan France unless the Gaul is brought back to power. And he does come back under the condition that he can propose a new constitution, and it's approved overwhelmingly. So this is a, you know, a what we consider a democratic step, a referendum that says parliament should not be so central and the president should be much more important in the French system. At the same time, France is starting to unload some of its colonies. 
You have the independence of Morocco and Tunisia in 1956. And we've talked about Morocco uh, a lecture or two ago. I'm not going to repeat all of that because we don't have time. But it had not been uh, incorporated into the French polity the way Algeria had been. It was called a protectorate. In Algeria, on the other hand, and you can see this film that is well known on the left called the Battle of Algiers. It's not a happy presentation for either side, but there was a civil war going on uh, and thousands of people died. This is a memorial to some of those who have been killed. It says Algiers 1957, you know, thousands. And here you have this continuing feeling in Algeria, and I'll translate the title of this newspaper. It says, Algeria is France, and France will not recognize any other authority but its own. So this is the determination of, uh, of Algeria. And it's interesting that they're quoting here Monsieur Mitterrand, who later on, 25 years later, becomes president of France. And we'll talk about him again. But at that time, he stands for colonialism as well as all the other politicians in France. And that's that translation of what I just read to you. Algeria is France. And France will not recognize any other authority. You have in Algeria, a lot, and thousands of Algerians who sign up as a kind of uh, French police force. They're called the al uh, These are often unemployed, low-income people, and they become tools of the French government, and they're terribly resented by the Algerians. Uh, and when Algeria gets independence in 62, thousands of al are killed in revenge. Lots of them emigrate to France too with the French colonialists, the so-called Blackfeet, the Pieds Noirs. Uh, one of the analyses of Algeria is that the use of torture by the French is a kind of cancer of democracy. Uh, and I've always been impressed by that notion and I was reminded uh, of that when we had this scandal of waterboarding by the CIA, how this just works to undermine our democratic values. You know, we, could, we condone it abroad, unfortunately. De Gaulle goes to Algeria in 1958 and he says, je vous ai compris, I have understood you. He speaks to thousands of French settlers there. He says, I, know, I have understood you. I know what happened here. I see what you have to do. I see that the path that you have opened in Algeria is the path of renewal and of fraternité, brotherhood. Remember, we've talked all along how uh, the French have used this motto, liberty, equality, fraternity. Uh, but if you read closely what he says, it isn't clear exactly what he is understanding. And you'll see later on, <clears throat> people accuse de Gaulle of having stabbed them in the back. And here he is in the uh, L'Eco de Rouen. Rouen is one of the major Algerian cities. And it says here, before, in front of more than 500,000 Algerians massed on the, the forum and, de and demanding their faith, in the destiny of French Algeria, de Gaulle says, I have understood you. And here he is, raising his arms in triumph. In all of Algeria, there are only Frenchmen with the same rights and the same duties. He says that, of course, the Muslims do not have the same rights, do not have the same duties. If you recall, I've talked about this Blum Violetta proposal in 1937 to give a very modest a number of rights to the to the Muslims and the the colonists prevented that. 
Here he is, a strong France and Al a French Algeria. And this is de Gaulle addressing the crowd. And all in Algeria, there are only Frenchmen with the same rights and the same duties. I express my confidence in the French army. I count on it for today and to for tomorrow. So de Gaulle, remember, he is not a Democrat in the sense of wanting wide powers for everybody. There are certain things that have to be imposed in his notion of governments. Well, you have a general, Raoul Salon, who at that time, long live de Gaulle, vive de Gaulle. And de Gaulle says, I have understood you, je vous ai compris. But Salon becomes a founder of the OAS, the uh, secret army. Algeria is French and will remain so. And when uh, as Salon, who had been a, a French commander in chief in, in Indochina, and then in Algeria, he was the most decorated soldier in the French army. But in 1961, he and four generals organized a putsch. A putsch is sort of an attempted revolution. Uh, Salon was arrested in 1962, sentenced to death, and then commuted to imprisonment. Uh, I mean, it was commuted to life imprisonment, and in 1968, he's pardoned. He had a guy who tried to overthrow the government. This is a picture of people leaving Algeria. We have a Close to a million people left. They could not live with what they consider an agreement for independent Algeria. And they, these pieds noirs, black feet. Uh, first, there were assassinations by the secret army, perhaps 2,000 people, because they wanted to torpedo the agreement of independence. But to the surprise of the French government, the Pien Noir left right away. Uh, and there was a massacre of the uh, Pien Noir in, in the city of Oran in 1962. The number of those who were killed is debated, but it gave a, an impetus to that uh, exodus, which people, you know, they, they still live in certain areas of France and are strong right-wing voters. Uh, I'm sorry, I've used this word Pien Noir several times. There it is, spelled out. I mean, where, I, I don't remember where that comes from, the, the title Black Feet, but it's, it's not pejorative. It just refers to the French settlers. In 1962, in Avion, in Switzerland, we have an agreement for Algerian independence. And this is a picture of Algerians celebrating their independence, 1962. And we have the Pien opposing. March 19, 1962, the truth is what they're saying is 150,000 French Muslims and 10,000 Pien were assassinated, killed after that date. So these are people saying this was an ugly agreement. That's the translation of what I just read. Well, here we are in this whirlwind uh, review of French colonialism, because it's really important to understand that France, in many ways, is falling apart internally, in part because of disagreements of what's happening to its empire. After 1945, Indochina becomes a hot war. Now, why is Indochina in the, important to France? Uh, several reasons. One, are there, some people are making a lot of money out of Indochina, and they are influential in France. But it's also this notion of the glory of France. It is hard to face up to the decline of that empire. Uh, here you have. French paratroopers landing in Indochina, saying, we're going to hold on to this country no matter what. 
Uh, here you have French soldiers in Indochina. It's really reminiscent of the US in Vietnam 15 years later, the same kind of thing. In France, you have a prime minister, Pierre Mondes France, who is, in my mind, a kind of a replay of Leon Blum. You've got to cut the knot and get out. And that's what he did. He just said, we're leaving Indochina. We can't support this any longer. It's tearing France apart. Uh, it's unbearable. Now, he never said this about Algeria, but he did say it about Indochina. And to his credit, he was able to get, get France out. We had, as I just mentioned a minute ago, Dien Bien Phu, this fortress, fort up in the north, absolutely surrounded. And here you have August 1954, uh, communist troops are allowed to enter areas uh, that had been held by France. Yeah, August 1954, the end of the French colonial empire in Indochina. It's a very telling picture, I thought. This is just to review. This is a slide that I showed you way back in the very first class, and it probably was confusing, and it might be confusing now, but I want to mention it again. In the late 19th to the mid 19th century, you had four kinds of monarchies. You have before 1789, Louis XVI, uh, then you have the, the, the king as a prisoner for three years, then, and then you have a republic overthrown by Napoleon, right here, 1804 to 1815. Then you have a king again, 1815 to 1830, really reactionary, Louis XVIII, Charles X, and they get overthrown to a more liberal monarchy, 1830 to 48, two kings there. And then they get overthrown in this uh, unrest of 1848 and you kind of kind of republic and the republic is ended by a referendum that brings in Napoleon III. So, you know, you're going back and forth. And then from the mid 19th century, you're starting up again here, uh, if you recall, Napoleon III is in charge of war, is lost to the, to the Germans. And 1870 and 39, you have what's called the Third Republic. The Third Republic is defeated by the Germans. And we get a quasi-military dictatorship under Pétain. Uh, and what's called a dictatorship by consent. The Germans are even in more control. The Germans are defeated, and we have a republic in them, the Fourth Republic. The Fourth Republic is torn apart by the same conflicts as the Third Republic. And in 58, they called the Gaul, and he sets up what is now a strong uh, presidential form of government. It survives a coup attempt in 1961. And we'll talk about this later in 1980, the first socialist president, François Mitterrand. Well, that's where we are. That's this rapidly changing form of government in France. Uh, and this is this notion of France, a country where you have protests that happen quite a bit. Uh, not always successfully, but you can call out a crowd for a lot of things in France. Well, on the happy side, they have something called Les Trente Glorieuses, with a uh, typo here, it should be an L. The 30 Glorious Years, 1946 to 75, or 45 to 76, however you count it. What it says, it, first of all, the name is uh, harkens back to 1830, where they had the 30, uh, Three Glorious Days. Now you have the 30 glorious years where France economically enters the, what we consider the 20th century. And here's an image of France where you have both, uh, well, here's a, a postman in his uniform, a, a 
peasant costume, a naval officer, a chef. That is, these are people who are now participating in what we see as a modern society. Uh, I don't want to spend a lot of time on numbers, just real fast. The population grows from 46 to 75, hearing 40 to 52 million. Agriculture declines, as we are familiar in other industrialized countries, drop down to 10% of the workforce. People do better. They work fewer hours per year. Um, private automobiles all of a sudden increase 15 times life expectancy go for males to 69 and for females to 77. That is economically, the country is doing much, much better in these 30 glorious years. And the, 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 the term has continued. It's part of French lore. And as I say, it, it, the title is reminiscent of the three glorious uh, years, uh, days of 1830. Here's an example. A village of Madère, they ate meat once a week, no butter, a little bit of cheese. And not, not very good typists. The basis of their food should be food here. Bread and vegetable soup with some pork fat. One 15 watt bulb costs more than an hour's wage. And then you get the emergence of a consumer society based on food, sanitation, schooling, transportation, and so on. And if you think about it, the three basics for living in this consumer society are running water, a bathroom, and an indoor WC. I would have to add to that electricity, but this is even just a, a wholly different life when you have this uh, life based on decent plumbing. And this was really uncommon before 1945, except in some fancy urban areas. Uh, here's this sign, uh, that's a book, 1945 to 75, a, uh, a joyous France. Moulinex, you know, household appliances, liberates the woman. Frigidaire, uh, you know, this is something new. It means electricity too, as well as plumbing. And here we have a, an automobile fair. Remember I mentioned that they have 15 times as many private cars in 1975 as in 1945. So these are all pictures uh, celebrating what's going on in France. It's interesting here, it's not so different from the United States where a number of these automobile, automobile brands don't exist anymore. You know, the Panhard, the Simca, uh, the Fiat's in trouble, the Talbot I never heard of, Peugeot is hanging on. Renault owns Peugeot, owns Citroën. Well, once again, the Fifth Republic, you have De Gaulle and a strong president, and he doesn't, he's very unhappy with this notion of the decline of France as a world power. And he starts to build on this common market. It's open 1957, which was really at that time the European coal and steel community. So even the Gaul went along with cooperating with the, well, the six countries, you know, the uh, French, Germany, Italy, uh, and what's called Benelux, that is the Belgium, Netherlands, and the uh, Luxembourg. And here you, here you have this initial European coal and steel community, which evolves into uh, the common market, and then what we call today the European Union. But as you see, it's a Western European thing initially. In 1993, they call it the European Economic Community. And uh, over the years, the, the uh, powers to that community expand. 
you know, it's headquartered even now in Brussels, and it's quite the thing to campaign a nationalist campaign against Brussels, because they say they're the bureaucrats in Brussels have taken over our country. That's a complaint. But the European Economic Community today has 28 countries. Uh, it has the euro, as you see here. Uh, there's a certain amount of criticism of the euro, but there it is uh, as a uh, the currency in almost all the countries of the European market. It's not every country in the economic community accepts the euro, but most of them do. You also have, if we had, you know, we had those uh, glorious years, but there's something called the deindustrialization of France. I found this, this great sentence here. France is a pure case of a voluntarist country subjected to the test of globalization intermediated by the European Union, whose long-term effects on de deindustrialization can be judged. What's that mean? It means, to me, Despite government efforts, France is losing its industry. Uh, I was, uh, you know, I was in the university a long time ago and I got used to that jargon, but boy, that's really something. And President Macron wants to reverse that deindustrialization. And he just made this comment not too long ago where he's celebrating 25 French unicorns. Unicorn is a term used now for startups privately owned worth more than $1 billion each. 25 French unicorns, we are there. These 25 startups valued at more than $1 billion and with them all of French tech will change the lives of the French, creating hundreds of thousands of jobs everywhere in France. These form our sovereignty. This is only the beginning. Well, so you see there's this image that you know, despite what I've been talking about, the decline of the French Empire, France is a, still an important industrial country despite its problems. And here you have an attempt to to uh, re reinvigorate French economy, and so they talk about investment projects from abroad uh, captured by France in 2021. Uh, are these big numbers? I don't know. You know. France is still a country whose uh, exports are heavily luxury goods, uh, although they do have some heavy industry, but it's still tough for Germany, for France. Going back, I, I jumped to Macron, but well, let's go to 1981. François Mitterrand is the candidate of the Socialist Party. The, the fact that a socialist should be elected president is just incredible to the French people. Here we have May 10, 1981, le jour du grand soir, the day of the great evening. He is becoming, oh, it's gonna be a whole new, new society with the socialists in charge. Uh, that's the notion. And uh, Mitterrand has sort of kind of a checkered past in a way, uh, he, he, including working with the Vichy government in, in the Second World War, but he worked with Vichy, then he worked with the resistance against the Nazis. He brought the Communist Party into the government and this notion of changer la vie, changing life. And they do things, abolition of death penalty, increase the minimum wage, limit the work week to 39 hours, extend workers' rights, improve pensions and family allowances. These are all important things. It's not a, a revolution in the sense of overthrowing the old elites, but it does improve the life of many people in the lower income categories. And foreign policy is not so great. There's this gallus tradition of France being great. And in fact, if you recall the Rwandan massacres of the 1990s, there's a lot of suspicion that the French knew what was going to happen and didn't do anything about it. You can't prove that, but there's certainly that that's a suspicion of what happened in the 1990s. 
So France has retained a tremendous interest in Africa. Uh, and here you have Mitterrand with, you know, you have this uh, conservative wave, Margaret Thatcher, Ronald Reagan. Here's Mitterrand. And Helmut Schmidt is from the left, but he's replaced in 1982 by Helmut Kohl, a conservative. So there's this conservative wave going over the Western world. And this has continued. If you look at the uh, <clears throat> decline of the socialist parties in Europe, it says social democratic and total left share of the votes in countries that were members of the, <clears throat> it's called that the European Union as of 1990, were dropping. Uh, here you have in 1960, they're, they're between uh, 28 and 30%. You read up. See a high point in 1980. This is the time when Mitterrand is elected, steadily down to 2020. And in fact, in the 2022 elections, there was a consideration of the Socialist Party disappearing altogether. We'll see a little bit of more, a little bit more of that in a few minutes. But in France, liberty, equality, and fraternity are still celebrated. And it's equated with secularism, but as you're probably aware, there's a tremendous anti-immigrant feeling in France, particularly against Muslims. Uh, here you have police activity. Uh, this is pro-immigration here. And then in 2015, a slaughter of people in the uh, Bataclan Concert Hall, we unfortunately in the United States have our experience with mass murders. This is something that has uh, remained in the French consciousness where people come into a concert hall and open fire. At the same time, at the same time, you have private schools that under secularism, you want there's a feeling of we don't like private schools, but the government still subsidizes them. And as I mentioned, the terrorism uh, attributed to Muslim fundamentalists, 2015, Charlie Hebdo, this is an attack on the satirical, the editorial board of a satirical magazine for having published uh, derogatory cartoons of Muhammad and the attack at the Bataclan concert hall in 2015. These things are really engraved in French consciousness. Well, I wanted to point this out, that the Muslims have settled in industrial regions, especially Paris. And in the United States, a suburb is often used as a, a synonym for a wealthy area, people fleeing the city. In France, a banlieue, a suburb is different, and it's seen, especially around Paris, as a area of Muslim terrorists, drug dealers, anti-French feeling. So be careful when you see, talk about French suburbs. This is not what we uh, generally think of as uh, a, an advanced region. I should point out that of these Muslims, most of them come from Algeria and North Africa, not as someone might claim from uh, Saudi Arabia or Iraq. They're from North Africa. Remember, traditionally, France has been very involved in North Africa. But we're beginning to get Muslims from West Africa, too. and. By the way, there is a movement in the uh, Muslim community that not everybody's a terrorist, you, you, of course not. In fact, we think that 10% of the students in Catholic schools <coughs> are Muslim because the parents wanna have a disciplined life for their children. And then in 2017, 
we have the election of Emmanuel Macron. I think Emmanuel probably has two M's in it. Uh, and for some people, this is a new France. It wasn't clear where he stood on the left-right spectrum. You know, there were people who had a lot of, of uh, optimism about a new left like Mitterrand in the 1980s collection. But he has turned out to be a figure of the center right, uh, not an extremist, but no uh, rabble-rousing lefty either. But there was this feeling in 2017, there'll be a new France. You have a dominant majority in the French assembly. His chief opponent on the right is a woman named Marine Le Pen. Here she is. Who is Marine Le Pen? Some of you may be familiar with the name. She's the daughter of a rabble rousing right winger. Today, she's. Uh, still on the right, but she doesn't talk about anti-Semitism or overthrowing a democratic government. She talks about perhaps leaving uh, the uh, European community because Brussels has too much influence. She talks about uh, giving power back to the small people and taking it away from the elites. Uh, and she ran She's run several times for president in 19, and in 2022, she and the Macron faced off. She won, uh, you know, they have a, a two-stage election and the, the, the two top vote getters become the finalists. So she's really moved up there. And she is the architect of what is called, uh, a little a word I'm having a little trouble translating, the uh, de l'Abolacination de la France, that is to say, uh, Undeviling, make, taking away this devil image of the right wing and making it a respectable political party. This notion is built on, you see, these protests in the late teens of the yellow vests, that is, people who started by complaining about the price and taxes on gasoline for cars, but it's a tremendous unrest in all over France, over, and that is not even clear exactly what the unrest is about, but they are people dissatisfied. And here's a picture of this idea, wearing the yellow vest is a sign of your protest. Uh, they play a role in those presidential elections of 2022. They hadn't appeared yet in 2017. But what happens is that you have the collapse of the Socialist Party and the rise of Macron. And in the 2022 election, the right wing brings up other characters. And here's a, a man named Eric Zemmour. Uh, this is uh, an invidious comparison between, Zim not invidious, but a comparison between Zemmour and Donald Trump. Uh, you know, Zemmour, Interestingly enough, his, his uh, heritage is Algerian Jewish, and now he's become uh, sort of a, a rabble rouser on the right. Whether he may have been a flash in the pan, maybe he was, maybe he wasn't. We'll see as uh, France goes on. Right now, Marine Le Pen is out polled him. He ran for president, uh, and he got a lot of publicity. But I point to him as a symptom of this resurgent right wing. And it, there is a, a good deal of uh, similarity between his message and that of Donald Trump. On the other end, you have Jean-Luc Mélenchon, former communist, now left winger, ran for president, and he actually was able to form uh, a block of the left called Nupes, uh, I can't remember what all the initials are, but it's the socialists and the ecologists and others. Uh, he really pushed very hard for a majority in the assembly so that he could be prime minister. That didn't happen, but he's still a force to be reckoned with. And here is Jean-Luc Mélenchon. Take power is what it says. He's uh, very, it's the left is here, up here. 
he is a, uh, it, it's sort of a, a reformation of the popular front in a way, but he didn't take power. I also wanted to point out the role, the place of women in France, because among Western countries, they are, France has been one of the slowest at giving rights to women. They didn't get the right to vote till 1944. Uh, in 1949, Simone de Beauvoir publishes a well-known book, The Second Sex. This is a sort of a detailed analysis of the oppression of women. And it's become a fundamental book of contemporary fem feminism. So you get the, you know, in 1965, women are allowed to their own checking account. They're not married women. And married women are allowed to own property under their own name. That's really uh, something new in France. Uh, abortion becomes legalized. 1999, uh, civil marriage, or it's not exactly marriage, but it's a pax. It's a, a recognized relationship. And divorce becomes simplified. And like a lot of other countries, 61% of children are born outside of marriage. In France, it's not an exception here. If you look at all these countries, I mean, we're not like Iceland, we're 66%. Our United States, 40% uh, of births are outside of marriage. So, you know, societies are changing, including women. Now, do children born out, outside of marriage, is that emancipation for women? Maybe, maybe not. In some ways it is, in other ways it means that men are abandoning the, the wives and children. In 2022, you have Elizabeth Bone just named prime minister. It's only the second woman ever to be a prime minister in France and the first woman uh, got kicked out of office for corruption. Unfortunately, she was involved in something, but we'll see how long Elizabeth Bone lasts. And I have often mentioned books to you. I ran across this. Uh, there's a website and they say what they call the quote, the best books on modern French history. What was interesting to me is that I was impressed by some of these same books. Here's this two volume thing by Theodore Zeldin, which I mentioned to you. I've mentioned Peasants into Frenchmen. Uh, I've mentioned Robert Paxton, an American author who turns around the way French look at each other. And then, then these two others, here's uh, uh, Alistair Horn, and this is in French, this is a memoir by Emmanuel Leroy Ladurie. But you can look for this fivebooks.com if you're looking for references. Well, I'd like to just pointing out a few things that are going on in France. French like to say that, uh, you know, it's a country of Frenchmen, but you have 10% of the population in 2018 were foreign nationals at six and a half million people. Uh, here you have total foreign born. France has, well, here it's 11% in 2010. And, you know, various European countries. That is, Europe is not accustomed to admitting that it's a, a continent of immigration. The United States until recently celebrated its, its, uh, its status as a country of immigration. And I think it's one of our strengths. The Europeans are having trouble coming to terms with that idea. By the way, there are about 100,000 Americans living in France. So it's also, it's, attractive in many ways. You know, half of the immigrants come from seven countries and you see that of those, uh, Algeria, Morocco, and Tunisia, <coughs> former French colonies, and then other countries uh, in Southern Europe, they're concentrated in big urban centers, Paris, Lyon, Marseille, and other cities. More recently, because of wars going on, you're beginning to get uh, people from East Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa, and I, we mentioned this last week, is subject to this enormous population increase. 
And although most of the migration in Africa is within Africa, there are so many people there that they're very conspicuous, even in immigration into Europe. I should also point out that over half of the immigrants were women. And that's a, a problem for these societies which have empowered women, and that is the European societies, and they, these women come from societies where women really play a subordinate role. And it's, a, it's an issue. Most of them work in construction or in the manufacturing in traditional sense. Uh, France has renounced assimilation and introduced integration. We'll see. Uh, and the same, and this is just what's going on in France because we're running out of time here. Uh, Mitterrand, socialist hopes, the socialist left collapses, and the Mélenchon has this uh, NUPES, stands for New Ecologic and Social People's Union, popular front. And I mentioned the, uh, the polarization of French society here, uh, center right, far right, far left. Macron, Le Pen, and Mélenchon. I did want to mention at the end what happened in the recent elections. Uh, first of all, 53% <coughs> turned out. That's really low by French standards. And what you get is here's the uh, National Assembly. This is the Macron party, these yellow business here. And the purple, Nupes, the Mélenchon left, and the right, is is here the right wing and uh, what's her name Le Pen's party very strong eighty nine seats and you should remember by the way our whole vocabulary left and right comes from France from the French National Assembly seventeen eighty nine the left the left are the radicals and it moves around the circle because they were on the left of the speaker stand and that has become part of our vocabulary. The, uh, here really, I'm not gonna go through those seats, especially not in five minutes, but that's 577 deputies. And here you have, that's what it looks like. Macron party is the largest, but they're not enough to form a majority. And that's going to be the uh, task of Macron to build, if he can, to build a coalition. I should point them out, that under the constitution established by the Gaulle, the government has the right to decree a law for a limited period. Uh, you know, we have something that, uh, it's not quite the same, but executive orders in the United States do something like that, but not quite as extensive as in France. So here you have Le Pen is a major game for those frustrated by the French government, the environmentalists and the left are still alive, but discouraged, and the traditional right still alive and functioning. Uh, and I should mention that France has these overseas territories. They claim they're not colonies, they're part of France. Just as an example, they're all over the place. Uh, that This is not the colonies, this is French people living abroad. Well, where is France going? The land of liberty, equality, and fraternity. First of all, does it still have colonies? Well, it's not clear. It's, it's subject to deindustrialization, despite Macron's talk about there's 25 unicorns and high tech. Uh, and here's an example, the decline of manufacturing. This is not different from other Western countries, but it's, it, really heavy duty in France, where uh, the share of manufacturing in consumption and investment uh, here, this yellow line, really dropping way, way down by a third, at least since the uh, uh, 1975. The, it, France is involved in the European Union and 
Brussels makes a lot of decisions that French claim are incorrect. And uh, the, Le Pen uses money from the European Union, but she talks about possibly leaving and they talk, they attack the Euro. And here is, uh, we heard about Brexit, you know, here's the right wing Frexit, not as widespread a movement in France as elsewhere, but it's still there. And in fact, if you, whoops, I don't know why that disappeared. Uh, see what it says here, Action Française, that was a group goes back to the 1890s, came to the fore in the Dreyfus affair, and they're still around as a part of the right wing. Well, here's a question. Does France still have colonies? Well, they claim that Guyane in South America is part of France. Corsica, an island, is part of France. Guadeloupe in the Caribbean. Martinique in the Caribbean. Mayotte in the Indian Ocean, Réunion. And each of these is considered a department of France. And it is true that they have delegates to the French assembly <coughs> equivalent to other delegates, but there are not that many of them. So uh, you may have some independence movements, but they're not real strong at this point. Right now, uh, they still are considered part of France as a whole. I don't know why my computer keeps doing that. This is, uh, remember, they talk about the hexagon. That's the, if you will, the continental France, and then other places abroad. Do they still have colonies? I don't know. De Gaulle had a dream of a French commonwealth of nations. Didn't work out. They all went independent. There you see them. But France still has econ strong economic interests there. And uh, I'm not going to go through that. We don't have time, but it is available. Those are all these countries with a huge, huge increase in population. We talked about that last week. Uh, there's something called La Francophonie, the members of an international organization uh, who speak French. They talk about equality, complementarity, and solidarity. That's their, uh, it's based on liberty, equality, fraternity. And here you have a list of countries where French is the only official language. Look at all those uh, uh, French speaking uh, African countries. You have some where it's a co official language including in this case, Belgium and Canada, but then lots of African countries. Uh, forgot to include those, including Switzerland. Even uh, the state of Louisiana has joined this uh, international organization of Francophonie. Does that mean that uh, France is important? Not necessarily, but it does mean that French is really a widely used language. Interestingly, Algeria has not joined that association. You know, there's a sticky relationship between Algeria and France. Is colonialism dead? Charles de Gaulle in what became Guinea, independence celebration in Dakar and Senegal, François Mitterrand in Cameroon in 1983. French influence, is that colonialism? Depends whom you ask. What does Le Pen want? What does Macron stand for? Well, they differ on the European Union. That's the flag of the European Union. Uh, and as we saw that slide a few minutes ago, originally it was just these countries in here. Now it's all over the place, although they have Turkey as an official candidate, it's doubtful that they'll ever admit Turkey. What's important here in France is the centralized decision-making, the dirigisme, that is the direction from the center and that prefect is really important. Uh, parliament is really divided like the Third Republic. Remember that thing was torn apart because they could not agree on anything. But now you have a strong president who can sometimes get around some of that. 
And let me close. Charles de Gaulle says, France cannot be France without greatness. Well, I don't know if you what you mean by that, but that is France still has this tremendous image of itself as an important country in the world. And that's uh, sort of rushed through stuff here at the end. I wanted to get to 2022. Uh, and it's it's 12 o'clock. You can certainly log off. You can take a couple of, if there are questions or comments, we are glad to stay. Uh, Jules, you have to unmute yourself. Yeah, just uh, one question. I have heard that France is increasingly uh, becoming a Muslim country by the people who have been migrating to France from Africa. There's, at the same time, I don't need to tell you that France is uh, second only to Germany in the amount of anti-Semitism and the amount of uh, Jews that have fled France to go to Israel, particularly in the city of Ashdod, where they make up a considerable portion of the population. Do you have any comments on that? Well, two things, uh, and you, you're talking about two different things. First of all, is France a Muslim country? Well, it has a large Muslim population. Does that make it a Muslim country? No, uh, and in fact, uh, it's quite controversial, and you have a government which, as we've talked over time in this course, has taken a, a number of anti-Muslim stands that, uh, you know, against the wearing, say, of, of uh, religious clothing and stuff in public, uh, they are seen as terrorists. And it's really a very difficult thing where there are certainly terrorists in the Muslim population, but you have a large population that just wants to get on with life. Uh, so does that make it a, a Muslim nation? No more than Belgium is a, a Muslim nation. Uh, it's got, you know, in the United States, we have a tradition of accepting minorities. France is having a problem with that. Uh, as far as anti-Semitism goes, yes. Uh, and a lot of it comes, grows out of the Muslim community uh, because of the, the stance on Israel. But what's different from, say, the Dreyfus Affair or the 1930s is that the government is staunchly in favor of individual rights and opposes that kind of stuff. Uh, you're right, there is a significant emigration of French people to Israel, although it's not emptying out of Jews. But the Jews are, especially in Muslim areas of, of the cities, uh, Jews don't feel safe. So what's the future of that? I don't know. Uh, France, like other countries, has lots of anti-Semites. It's not an anti-Semitic country in its policies. Uh, Paul and then Neville. You were uh, questioning whether colonialism is still the, um, the way to identify France and its relation to its former uh, colonies. Um, the, the term that's used now is neocolonialism. Um, and it, uh, it describes that the relationship uh, between a former sub, uh, subservient, subservient uh, uh, country um, that, that had been colonized uh, once it's independent, but still the, uh, the former parent country has tremendous influence and to a large degree control. Now, even the United States um, uh, has that uh, reputation as a neo-colonial power, even over countries we've never actually colonized, but we do have tremendous influence. Yeah, I mean, that's true that in terms of, you have independent countries officially, but they don't, in many cases don't have control over their own economies. Uh, but, you know, that's another issue. But, okay, if you want to call it neocolonialism, and it's true, that's the way newspapers call it. Uh, Neville? Am I Wait, you muted yourself again. So, so in the old, 
if you look at Britain, uh, the, the British Empire obviously generated enormous revenue for Great Britain. It became an incredibly wealthy country. The areas that France controlled were never economically very valuable. Most of it was Sahel and the parts of Africa where trading, it seemed to me, was never a big revenue. So mostly it was glory, right, rather than economics that generated their interest in keeping the colonies. Well, that's partially true, although when you say it was, they were not revenue generators, they were revenue generators for certain elites. Yeah. Who, who controlled natural resources, both in West Africa and in Indian China. So the government itself was sort of corrupt. That is, lots of bureaucrats were taken in by this. Uh, and, and then they talked about the French mission and the civilizing mission. But even today, uh, you know, as Paul points out, with neocolonialism, the accusation is that French companies control the economies of a number of countries in West Africa, even though officially they are independent. So on a macro scale, perhaps they're not making money, but individually there are companies that do it. And I think the United States has some patterns like that too for Latin America. Thank you. Anybody else? Well, uh, it's, oh, it's after 12, we really have to stop. Uh, it's been an exciting class. I gave today. I had a lot of stuff that was far more than one class worth. But thank you all for coming. Uh, read the papers. Read about France. Uh, it's an interesting society. So I'm going to end the meeting. Hope to see you all soon. Thank you. Thank you. Adieu. Okay.